All right. We are going to jump in with Curtis Linton in our next segment. Don't go away. We'll be right back. We are very pleased and lucky to have Curtis Linton on tonight with us. Curtis is currently the CEO or Chief Education Officer of Curious School. Throughout his career, Curtis has documented the improvement efforts and best practices of the most successful schools across North America. Curtis has authored several books, including Equity 101, The Equity Framework, and co-authored Courageous Conversations About Race, which received the 2006 National Staff Development Council's Book of the Year. Curtis lives in Salt Lake City with his family and is joining us from the Mountain Time Zone tonight, and we're really privileged to have him. And I think on a personal note from all of us, um, you know, Curtis from afar and from the books that he's written has played an integral role um, in shaping our work with equity and probably our own personal um, and school-based equity journeys. Yep. Definitely. Especially mine as as a school leader had a big impact on me. So, Curtis, we want to start with kind of the, the big, broad umbrella or big, broad strokes and uh, just ask you, how do you define equity in schools? Well, the best way to differentiate between equity and equality as it relates to a school environment is that equality, the, the, you know, the, the effort towards equality, Brown versus Board, is about equality of resources at the entrance, so every child who shows up at school is going to be, um, you know, is going to be able to access an equal number of resources. We've been stuck in this paradigm of equality, but equality, if everyone is treated the same with the resources in an equal system, then individual needs are not recognized within that. So equity shifts us towards considering the outcome. So rather than equal input, equity asks us to look for an equal outcome. And so uh, similarly linked to that, you know, we've, we've always, we're always talking about from a leadership perspective, how are we going to implement equitable outcomes or equitable practices for teachers to make those outcomes more beneficial for students? What kind of successful frameworks have you seen put in place that helps students of color achieve. And one of the things that I wanted to, to kind of re- swing it back to was in, in the Equity 101, you talk about culture, practice, and you talk about leadership. Is, is that, would mm-hmm. that be where you're, where you're going from, from in terms of the framework? Yeah, definitely. Because, um, so, so let me give you some background on the Equity Framework. So the Equity Framework came from asking the question, what commonalities would we see in schools that have eliminated their achievement gaps. And what came out of that were these strong commonalities. Even even though each of the schools had very unique learning cultures, different you know, communities and students that they were serving, um, and they were not always using the same language to describe their values. But one of the most common pieces out of this, and this is where that definition of equity came from, is that every single one of these schools had recognized the critical need to personalize the learning experience for each student. These were not schools which were, you know, where, where your strategies that you, imply in, that you apply in the classroom were what completely defined the teaching experience. They weren't schools that just depended upon a dynamic leader. They also weren't schools which were just simply a a beautiful and accepting, inclusive culture. They balanced these things. One of the schools you focused on was Elmont High School, or is it Elmont Memorial High School? Yeah. So you're talking about values. Can you you elaborate a little bit on on what you mean by, did you find that they had the values in place and it just... It just happened to be in that situation that made them successful, or no? Did no, you have to? Did you have not. to supplant that with something? You no, know, it's it's deliberately crafting the values, and so it's saying if we really believe in creating a curriculum that reflects, you know, the students that it's culturally relevant. That's not just a value we espouse when we talk about it; it's a value that's actually lived in the classroom. 
And, and I think I think this is where the conversation about equity has to go. I mean, it's really defining the work that I'm doing right now. It's thinking about applied equity, moving past the discourse and really saying, what evidence do we see in place that this is an equitable environment for students? And it's and and it's not only evidence in outcomes, Curtis. Just correct me if I'm wrong. It's just it's also evidence of how it's implemented. Um, just the way structures change, the way teaching practices change. Am I right there? Exactly. Exactly. In fact, it's. It's, it's a critical differentiator, and I was not clear in the way I described that. I jumped at evidence, but I did not clarify. I'm not actually talking about achievement data. Okay. I'm talking about evidence of practice. Okay. If I'm going to see evidence of equity, I'm going to see students progressing at personalized rates through the curriculum. I'm going to see a class where you know they may be focusing on – on um, you know, I, uh, understanding rich text and, and deriving information from it, but the students aren't all using the same book. The students are engaged in a topic that they're personally interested in. Got it. That 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 helps a lot. And I was, I'm always curious about how we kind of, like you said, differentiate that differentiate implementation versus outcomes. And so that makes a lot of sense. Peter, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I mean, mm-hmm. one of the things I really appreciated you said is that it's not just a strategy or, you know, a group of strategies. Cause I know, you know, and I've been guilty of this many times thinking that this, this strategy is going to be the, the panacea for everything that ails, you know, the universe basically. Um, mm-hmm. And one of the points that you make within, within the book and, and a lot of your work is that it's, you know, the framework, it's, it's many different pieces. Um, but I guess the, the question I have is, you know, let's just say I work in a school and, Everything you're saying, uh, I'm like, yes, yes. And I've, I have a lot of dedicated educa- educators that also want those same things. So what are some of the barriers that that prevent those outcomes from occurring? Because I know, you know, everywhere uh, there's lots of educators who want exactly what you're talking about. And yet we only see some of these successes, um, you know, in scattered spots. And it's not just more of like the widespread narrative uh, that we have right now about public education. Yeah. So, so um, it's 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 a really good question. I think it's very relevant to you know today's time. Uh, it's it's even something I've been writing a lot about lately, and it's it's the concept of autonomy. And but 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 I want to go beyond autonomy as just freedom to make my own decisions. And so think about where the control of the learning experience is centered. And so the closer you move towards seeing that control of the learning to the actual student, the more likely you are to have an equitable environment. So the further that the control of the learning moves away from the actual student, the less equitable it's going to be and the more the learning is designed for that mass middle. Okay, that's so I've got to follow up with this, Curtis, because – uh, I was originally – I was trained as an elementary educator and then um, eventually became a middle school principal having not worked professionally in a middle school before I became the principal of one, which is not something I'd recommend to anyone. Um, but uh, So I, I'm curious about school levels, school types. I'm big on uh, John Meyer's work on institutional structures. And I think mm-hmm. I think they kind of it kind of gets to what you're saying that we have these pervasive institutional structures like, for example, departmentalization at the secondary level or stratification, homogeneous grouping, these things that that are pretty pervasive across schools. H- how do those fa- yeah. how do those factor into your work uh, to the work that schools have to do and the work that you help them do in equity? Well, and, and honestly, a lot of my work today is more in response to principals who are being thrust into more autonomous situations. Um, I'll be honest with you guys, and this is hard to admit, but you know, over the last few years, I have what I've called my faith crisis in systems. Ooh, tell us more. I, I, That's I, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just – I can go into any city and find a dynamic school. 
a school where I want to show up and I want to write about it. I want to do a case study about it, all the rest. I, I can't find districts doing the same type of work. I just can't. And so, so when, when I say just from a, from a, you know, purely qualitative perspective, um, and I have not quantitatively proven this, but it, but that's kind of in my, my line of work in the future. Um, schools are pulling it off. Districts aren't. And when schools pull it off, it's because they're making decisions at that local level. Right. Right. The principal working with the teachers, working with the community are making decisions in response to the needs of the students. So schools are where it's at. Yeah, that, it's, 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 it's where it's at. Yeah, I, I would, I would agree. So um, based on that, I, I'm a huge fan of Sonia Nieto and Banks's work on multicultural education, and having been ra- mm-hmm. having been raised uh, as a teacher and a leader in the '90s, um, multicultural education was a big part of my classroom teaching experience. It seems to me that in some form or fashion, equity in some ways seems to have replaced a focus on multicultural education. I'm curious uh, if you would talk about these two these two approaches and how they relate to one another and also yeah. how they relate to the work that you do. Is multicultural education a big part of equity work? So the, the fourth force of privilege, um, primacy, it's counterforces empathy. And so I have to bring up empathy in relation to multiculturalism. Because multiculturalism is in its traditional application, rather devoid of empathy. Okay. It's rife with tolerance. Ah, and, okay. And, interesting. Very interesting. And, and very accepting. But it is, it is looking at difference as, um, as an outlier. So it's like, okay, we're going to shine light on the outlier. But multiculturalism doesn't require the practitioner to normalize the difference. It only asks them to acknowledge the difference. That's like putting up a bull- putting up a difference. bulletin board with like diverse pictures on it. Yeah. So so when you look at today, and and here is the bridge to equity. So so the idea of cultural relevance. And so typically, if I was to ask an educator, define cultural relevance. What are the things you would look at? Most quickly majority of educators will start talking about the heritage of the student. I have a student in my class whose parents are Latino immigrants, speak Spanish at home. They came from Guatemala. and Let's say they came from Mexico. You know, common, right? Okay, so cultural relevance is I'm going to represent some Mexican culture within my classroom. Okay. Okay. Uh, that is a misuse of cultural relevance. That's multiculturalism. Cultural relevance to the student is, let's say he lives in Rockville, right there in Montgomery County. Right. So, so you have a Latino male growing up in Rockville who speaks Spanish at home, whose parents are from Mexico. Cultural relevance to that particular student has little to do with Mexico has everything to do with being a Latino male, speaking Spanish at home, growing up in Rockville, Maryland. Cultural relevance is about the lived daily realities of the student. And so as a teacher, if I'm making the learning culturally relevant for this particular student that I've identified, I have to know what that student is interested in. If I'm just bringing in artifacts from Mexico... I go to Mexico on vacation and I tell the student, Hey, I was in Mexico on vacation. Right. Yeah. That the student looks at me glassy eyed. I've never been to Mexico. <laughs> yeah. That, that was pretty much multiculturalism in the nineties when I was a teacher. It was very much like that. Right. Yeah. Right. And I, I think that that definitely solidifies the fact that those kind of relationships, you, you can't have a substantial amount of learning without those kind of relationships. So like, one of the things exactly. that, one of the things that we wanted to and this is this is kind of going to close this out and I want I want to um, ask you a question that we're shifting gears a little bit but what is one thing that like so we've had many conversations about 
um, on this show about hiring and, and finding the best talent and, and how do you retain effective teachers? What's one thing, thinking from the frame of equity in, in, in hiring the best teachers in your school that you can share with us? Yeah, so um, what I'm going to propose is that equity, different from so many other efforts, the building of equity is based upon studying success. And so I will more quickly convert my school environment into an equitable environment when I look at where students are succeeding. And I, and I consider the structures that are in place so that we can replicate that success across the system. So when I think about hiring criteria, I'm going to hire based upon my most successful teachers. What are the things they tend to value? When I ask them, what defines you as a teacher, what do they answer? And so I have to do my own research on my school site and say, who are the teachers that I want to replicate? That's th- Does that makes sense. Yeah, well, that's yep. br- that's brilliant. Yeah. I was I was a principal for ten years, and now I'm kind of kicking myself because I, I I never did that, Curtis. <laughs> <laughs> well, and by the way, I'm totally stealing that question. <laughs> what defines you as a teacher? Oh, outstanding. Yeah. I'm like, let's do interviews tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> All right, good. Okay. Yeah. You know, once again, we'd like to thank you and uh, pr- invite people to check out CuriousSchool.org. It sounds like you guys have a lot of really interesting work going on um, that's focused around the child as the learner. So. Thank you so much, Curtis, and we will catch up with you next time. Awesome. Thank you much. All right. That was pretty great. Awesome. Yeah. That was awesome. Very good interview. Um, So there was a lot in there. Dare I say, let's unpack it. Let's unpack it. Because that's what you do. Awesome. So there's a couple points that I wanted to bring up and uh, kind of recap and then get your guys' thought on it. So one of the things that Curtis talked about was the commonalities between schools that reduce achievement gaps. So he talked about recognizing um, the need to personalize the learning for the students. And so each student is really getting what they need, which is certainly a lofty goal. Um, And obviously, the larger school size gets, the harder it becomes to personalize that learning for students. Um, And he also talked about when, when schools are not experiencing success, one of the things that you see is a lack of autonomy for students. And then the control of the learning experience really exists outside of the student and doesn't exist within them and for them. So I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that about you know, personalizing learning for students, what it looks like, what it is, what you think its effect is. Um, and then that second one, which I, I don't think I've really thought about as much, as much uh, the autonomy for the students and the control of the learning experience, because that's certainly, um, again, you know, to, I guess to paraphrase myself, a lofty goal um, to have the students control their own learning experience. I, ultimately, the, what, it, what Curtis was saying was the further the control goes away from the student, the less equitable outcomes there will be or the less equitable that particular environment will be. So we can use it a simple example as if a teacher's lecturing in a middle school or high school environment, you can, you can imagine that in general, that's not going to be an engaging class. It's not going to be the, the, the outcomes of that particular learning in that class is uh, they're not going to be high. Um, but, so I'm, I'm going to be devil's advocate. So there are no situations when teachers should be lecturing? No. Ever? Never. Ever? Never. It's the it's the it's the lowest learning modality. It's the least effective learning modality. Is listening. Boo. Yep. It's garbage. <laughs> you know why you're saying boo? Because it's easy. It's so easy. It's so easy. So let's lecture because people want to hear what I have to say. Let's lecture. You know, I, you know, you know I've heard recently in, in some schools, they the kids like my stories. <laughs> they like my stories. It, it like my blood literally boils, and I just want to actually just die in front of them. Aren't you? Aren't you killing a little bit of the inspiring part of of what teachers do if they don't? I mean, what's wrong with? There was a whole movie called Stand and Deliver. Oh, it's so good. Let's let's listen to what's, my stories. What's what's wrong with telling compelling stories that get kids inspired and excited about learning? M- most people and most teachers can't do that. <laughs> they can't. <laughs> they can't do that. They cannot do that Boy, because they're not willing to put in the effort. A, you, they're not. They a lot of them are, aren't willing to put in the effort. You are glass half empty. <laughs> I'm, not, on he's half, about I'm he's lecture. half full guy. I'm talking about time. folks who lecture and folks who think that their lectures 
you know, this is it. That's why I'm not planning for differentiation. You know, my kids that are reading at a second grade reading level, they're totally going to be into this lesson because I'm going to tell them an awesome story. <laughs> All right. So, so follow up anyway, on that. So, okay. So, so, what, so I, what, I, I was, what I was going to add to this yes. before he said that all lecturing was bad was that, to Casey's point, a lecture, I would say personalizing learning or, as you said, Casey, that distance between the learning and the kid, um, that it becomes further and further away as they go through school. I would, I would cite the example of whether a kid can see themselves in the curriculum. So if you can't see yourself in the curriculum, your background, where you come from, who you are, then you feel really far away from what it is you're learning. Uh, I think that's a, I think that's a big deal. And then the other thing that I would mention um, is that I do think that we know in secondary schools that a sense of alienation in kids grows, that they feel more and more disconnected from the institution that they're in. And that can be because of the way teaching transpires. It can be the curriculum. It can be just kind of those formal bureaucratic structures that separate kids from adults. Um, so I, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of things that I think – Instead of make learning more personalized as kids get older, it becomes more depersonalized. Yeah, and I, so I, I had a discussion with a colleague recently in going – this is like going way back to I mean, maybe it was episode one or two when we were talking about algebra and whether we should do away with algebra. And he was kind of like, well, then why don't we just make school into camp? And everybody gets <laughs> just to choose what they want to do and it's the fun activity that, that they want to awesome. do. But just in the context of what you were talking about, Robbie, which, by the way, yes, I was like, yes, let's do that. Let's make school <laughs> camp. But in the context of what you were saying, um, in depersonalizing and the sense of alienation, um, and, and it's, I know it's easier just to go and look at curriculum and say, look at the curriculum and, you know, the kids don't see themselves or the skills or the translation to real right. life and all that. And, and, to be honest, I do buy that. It's and, that relevance thing. Yeah. And the more and more that I'm in, education, you know, the more I guess I, I question like, man, like, are, is what we're teaching them and the skills that we're teaching them, like, how much is this going to help them? And I don't, I don't have an answer to that. I'm not like down on it or anything, but it's just, I've been asking myself that question more recently of like, all right, in the workforce, it's this wide and my hands are very wide right now. You can't see them. Very wide. Very, in, very wide. And in school, it's this wide. Right. En envision my fingers very close together. Very close. So... You know how can we, how can we broaden those learning experiences so that they don't feel that sense of alienation? So they do feel like I am choosing to learn something. That yes, the teacher is like also making me learn that I have to learn, but I'm also choosing to learn this because I want to learn it because I th I think I can use this because I see something, I get something out of this. Yeah. You know, today, tomorrow, next week, whatever. Absolutely. And, and there's two. There's one constraint that comes in my mind is where we have curriculum that's. Or not in the curriculum, but the standards by which students are learning that's coming from the state, and the state says that they have to learn, you know, uh, the social implications of feudal Europe for students who, you know, are are coming from El Salvador or they're they're coming from another country. It's it's n it's not inherently easy to make those connections personal for kids. No. You but can, you but can there's do nothing it. inherently wrong about learning about fe feudal Europe. I'm not saying there is, but what I'm saying is that in, in, initially, if you're a first-year teacher, you don't – or even a fifth-year teacher, you don't necessarily know how to make those connections with kids right? with, with regard to like something like medieval Europe. But it is, it is on the teacher to make those connections. And I guess I'm going to contradict myself because then I just thought of something else he says. <laughs> I was going to do everything. But you know, he did talk about um, – because when you bring up El Salvador, and he talked about – cultural relevancy and the need to meet the kids like where they are the lived daily reality of the student right yeah. you know and that being is a sort of inroad to make uh, some of those connections between seemingly like um disconnected maybe curriculum or ideas or skills to students you know you know them and, and you connect to like their actual lived daily life yeah and he i mean he mentioned that when i asked him about the difference or the overlap in multicultural education and cultural proficiency or equity, he mentioned that um, multiculturalism is 
kind of ripe with tolerance but devoid of empathy. That was that was my problem. My favorite quote. Right yeah, there. yeah, yeah, and that that to your point, Peter, understanding kids, understanding their their daily realities. Uh, an El Salvador child who has grown up here, uh, obviously they're connected to their background, but their childhood is here. So what is... What they come in and see every day is here. Right. Right. So what's unique about the blending of their background with their, with their lived experience in, in our schools and in our, our communities. And I, I think the word empathy is the one that sticks out to me is, we, we may never actually be able to experience or know what the, those children are going through or what they have gone through, but we need to be empathetic to what they have gone through. And a, a lot of teachers, and I've, I've been in there, I'm, I'm included in that, don't necessarily understand or know because of whatever reason, because the counselors know that this X, Y, and Z happened, or the yeah. assistant principal knows that this parent is not around for whatever reason. So the empathy piece is something that I think takes teachers – either time on their own to do it or they need to be coached to do it because they need to understand where their kids are coming from. Well, I'll give you an example of when I was a young elementary school principal many moons ago. um, The third grade team that I was working with was about to start uh, a chapter book, as we call them. Not the Apple Project, right? Have either of you ever heard of Sarah Plain and Tall? Of course. Okay. No. Well... I basically told them in in not a very refined leadership kind of way <laughs> in a school that was uh, mostly kids of color, mostly African American, that uh, if they made our third grade boys read Sarah Plain and Tall, they would all be in in professional trouble. <laughs> uh, because I I just and they got really upset with me. Yeah. Um, because they said it's you know, such it's, a great book and it has universal <laughs> themes yeah. and it's and I to your point. Peter, about the kid who is of a different background and is living here. I just didn't think Sarah Plain and Tall spoke to the kids, maybe. I'm sure it spoke to a lot of kids, but I just thought, let's find something a little bit more relevant than Sarah Plain and Tall. Um, No offense to Sarah Plain and Tall and to the kids that like it and to the teachers that like teaching it, but... Uh, I think I think we can work harder at making our classrooms more relevant to the kids that are in them. And it's you know, and it's, in I guess it's not to diminish the the difficulty of it because. So I'm thinking, right? So we talked about, and um, Curtis talked about, you know, you go on a trip to Mexico and there's a kid from Mexico in your class, and you're like, look at this, you know, little cool trinket I have, and like we made a connection. See, and it's like, okay, so there's kind of like one extreme example. Of not good, oh, right? Yeah. But then, I mean, there's a whole continuum of other things that you can do. And I'm, I, for me, I'm kind of like, well, like, what's good and what's bad in there? Like, right. what is me identifying and empathizing and what is me patronizing? Because there's definitely, I think, those two um, those two kind of categories rub up against each other quite a bit when you're trying to empathize and understand a student and you're trying to probably make some assumptions about what they think is important or how they live if it's something you know whatever so it could end up coming across as patronizing as well what did what did curtis say about the barriers to equity in schools you threw out a question <laughs> that i didn't know how to answer can i can i just actually go on peter's okay, point real don't quick? answer my question. <laughs> i'm sorry go ahead. so i listened to uh, Angela Watson's podcast, Truth for Teachers, and it was basically uh, the the episode that I listened to was about uh, beliefs that damage teacher relationships with black male students. Right, and one of the things that she talked about with her guest, and I highly recommend you listen to it, episode one oh six. It's a short episode, but it talks about, or they were talking about things that, like you said, Peter, patronize students. There was a time when you know having students do raps. In class, yeah. to, to to connect with kids, I'm sure that's something. I'm sure that still goes on. It does, and I think they think that they're connecting with kids, right. and they're not. Or or when a teacher, you know, mistakenly believes a new teacher believes that they need to talk in the vernacular of the, the students in, of whom they teach, and that's not necessarily you're pandering to kids. You're not actually teaching them uh, in ways that are culturally sensitive or culturally responsive. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. By the way, before we finish up. Mm-hmm. I was in a fourth grade classroom the other day during 
uh, reading language arts during the reading language arts block, and the kids were writing scripts for their own podcasts. Wow. That is awesome. Isn't that good? That's have, great. Have you seen that yet? Somebody doing that using writing, writing scripts for podcasts? I haven't seen writing scripts. I've seen teachers use as like anchor activities. to cr- They can create a podcast episode based on whatever really? topic they're doing. That's pretty awesome. I'd like to see what that so- or hear what that sounds like. Unless we have a question go unanswered for you, Robbie. I, I don't think he really talked about, oh, this is why schools don't have equitable practices or this is why schools aren't equitable if you recall i think he talked about equity is not deficit thinking it's inherently positive thinking and right. yep. focusing on things that schools do well and so when he talks about hiring or how to improve a school or whatever and he said to focus on look around your school and what are what is what are you doing well that what was a teachers pa- that doing was well a powerful statement take yes. that and yeah. that is your answer it's right. not yeah it's not in a can it's, it's not in a book it. it's right. You know what you're doing and what yeah. you're doing. Yeah. Let me take this, that, and who so, are the equity warriors right. in your midst that are doing the work right. that are not only not only um, equitable in their teaching, but they're also getting excellent outcomes. He also he um, also talked about the fact that um, t- uh, like when you're thinking about the barriers to equitable schools. It comes down to, and I completely lost my thought. That's really awesome. <laughs> it's really okay. great. So first of all, he totally didn't answer the question that I asked. Yeah, and then yeah. he just had uh, uh, a brain fart. Because a brain you fart. just you know, kept talking, and I had a thought, and I was ready to go, and okay. I didn't want to interrupt you because you're my former principal, all right. so I wanted to be nice and respectful, <laughs> well, and it didn't work. that was a great segment. Curtis Linton was an awesome guest. Yep. Uh, we hope the audience learned as much as we did, and we hope that it sparks thoughts and good discussion amongst you all out there in in your education work. Uh, he just made a face that he just had the thought. Do you want to say it before we go? That, you might be able to speak to this better than I can, but in terms of this, the school versus district implementation of equity. Okay, we are up against a break, oh, and yeah. we will save that for next show. Okay. Okay? Write the Actually, qu- we're probably going to forget it, so that's fine. <laughs> write, write the question down. No, do, 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 I'm good. Do, do, do. Anyway, I think there Peter's goes. writing it right thanks, now. Thanks again to Curtis Linton. We much appreciate him coming on Ed's Not Dead, and we will get him back in the future.